Well, we're continuing our review of the book of Psalms, and we're entering book three. The book of Psalms is actually five books. We're entering the third book, which includes Psalms 73 through 89 in total. And uh, so the, uh, this particular segment, book three, is sometimes referred to as the Leviticus section, if you will. And uh, the... Uh, uh, even in the first psalm, the sanctuary is very prominent. The, uh, the, the, that's why these things get these labels, if you will. And Leviticus, of course, is the book of worship. There are people that regard the book of Leviticus as the most important book of the Bible. That may surprise you, because for many of us, it may seem very dry and hard to, to get some value out of. Quite the contrary. It's one of the most important. You can't just read it. You need to study it. But it's one of the most important books of the Bible. But anyway, it does deal with worship. And it deals with holiness. And indeed, of course, the tabernacle and later the temple. And so that's why many scholars, serious scholars, treat Leviticus as the most important book in the Bible. Leviticus emphasizes two things, holiness, because God is holy. We need to understand that. And that's not an obvious, direct, easily attainable perception. We need to really understand what that really means. And of course, coupled with that is sacrifice, because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And that, and that root truth, the entire Bible uh, swings on that. So, We'll start this survey, this review of book three with Psalm 73, and it's a psalm of Asaph, Asaph being the choir uh, director, and uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it, for, this is the first of 11, a series of 11 that he wrote. He wrote one, uh, Psalm 50, and then this series from 73 to 83, uh, he wrote these 11 psalms. And uh, truly God is good to Israel, even do such as are of a clean heart. And um, those who come with their sacrifices are what's really implied in the, uh, the Hebrew expression here. Those that have a desire to serve God and walk with him. So, fair enough. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. And uh, Asaph is mentioning to say he's going to look around his nation and he's shocked at the Corruption that he beholds. As for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps were well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Here is this theme that continues to emerge throughout the Bible. All through the Bible. And um, this frustration that we experience as we see that the wicked prosper and the faithful seem to be injured. I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, he says, and for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. See, all of us engage these things. Many people get worried about their doubt. You know, doubt, come, and, doubt and disbelief are two different things. Doubt comes from a struggling mind. Unbelief from a stubborn will that refuses surrender. Those two ideas lurk behind this. There's nothing wrong with honest doubt. But um, unbelief comes from, is an is, is a act of will, actually. But moving on in verse 5. They are not in trouble as other men, speaking of the wicked, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compassed them about as a chain. I love that phrase. How, how descriptive. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. It's a shock to really appreciate how our pride makes us, puts us into bondage. That's what leads to envy and so forth. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. Anybody know anybody like that? <laughs> <laughs> they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. You know, it's interesting. You think of the news media, television. They all spread their arrogance and their ungodliness. And we should be very sensitive to that. Um, Therefore his people return hither, and waters 
of a full cup are wrung out to them and they say, how doth God know? And is their knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. That's a reality that we see today. That indeed the ungodly seem to prosper. They seem to be the ones that are unencumbered. And obviously they're accompanied with skepticism and, and worse. Verily I've cleansed my heart in vain, the, the psalmist says, and washed my hands in innocency. What he's really saying in effect is I have attempted to live for God, but it looks like it doesn't pay. That's really what he's saying. We need to applaud his candor. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning, and if I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until he did what? Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood I their end. That's the difference. See, it's easy. There's going to be a number of these Psalms in which Asaph's it's pretty much, he starts that way, and things look really dark, and it's very valid, very descriptive of our day to day, even. And yet, it all changes depending on where you're focused. And then I went into the sanctuary of God, then I under, understood their end. Then he took the long view. He realizes that it ain't over until it's over. Huh? Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. <laughs> Indeed. Thou cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors? As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. He's speaking metaphorically here as if God is asleep, and when he wakes up, he'll take care of all of that. That's idiomatically uh, uh, sort of the picture he's painting here. Thus my heart was grieved when I was pricked in my reign, so foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee, but nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. See, it's just, God, in effect, is doing with Asaph what he does to all of us. He asks, every day he asks us the question, do you trust me? That's really what he's saying. Do you trust me? And he takes us by the hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom, I, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And I'm reminded of Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If God has his hand on you, he finishes what he starts. Praise God for that. And... Uh, so Asaph takes refuge in that. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Question, where are you? Are you close to him or at a distance? Only you can answer that. That's the issue. Well, that's uh, Asaph's excursion there in Psalm 73. Let's go to Psalm 74. We're going to talk now about the temple being defiled. This, the theme here is a cry for deliverance when the temple is defiled by an enemy. And uh, some scholars seem to feel that Psalm 74 echoes the Babylonian destruction back in the 6th century B.C., 587, 586 B.C. And... Uh, Jeremiah speaks a lot about this and lamentations and so forth in the psalm. In some respects, it's parallel to some of that. Again, it's Asaph, a psalm of Asaph. And uh, so it's, uh, uh, Asaph was a, you know, a Levite, a musician. And uh, this may not be the original Asaph of David, something I should alert you to. Uh, there may be a namesake in subsequent generations, but that's, scholars aren't sure. So... Uh, O oh God, why hast thou cast us off forever? See, again, he feels distant. Again, he feels abandoned here. O oh God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Remember thy congregation which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion wherein thou hast dwelt. They're conscious of their, their being in the center of God's interest, and yet at the same time they feel abandoned. 
It's a real paradox. Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up their ensigns for signs. A man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees. Now, again, notice it's the sanctuary that's in focus here that has been apparently profaned. Before we get on to the history here in Israel, is that true of our sanctuaries today? Are the sanctuaries of the so-called church in America profaned? Are there tendencies called the emergent church where they're going back to incense and icons and medieval practices, practices that were extant when the Bible was not available as it is today? It's interesting to see the decline of the church in its many different forms. Our friends in Europe indicate that our uh, Kony Institute, uh, our internet fellowship that's growing so much, is a bigger thing in Europe than here because they don't have an alternative. If we think our churches are dead, take a look at the churches in, in, in Europe. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregation. They set up their ensigns for signs. You know, this seems to echo the fall of uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD when the Roman legions tore down the temple, burned it down, and put their ensigns at the eastern gate. Not in the Holy of Holies, as some people maintain, no, but at the eastern gate. They set up their ensigns for signs. And they took axes and cut through the gold-covered doors and so forth. Man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees and so on. See, Asaph's got a prophecy here, really. And some people feel that some of these echoes are prophetic of that terrible invasion by the forces of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was about 167 B.C., made circumcision a capital crime in Judea. And uh, uh, put a, you know, erected a, you know, a, a slaughtered a sow on the, a golden altar, on the uh, brazen altar. And ultimately erected a, an idol in the Holy of Holies. And that became known as the abomination of desolation. This is echoing some of those things. Uh, he was a, uh, uh, Antiochus was a, a, Syri a Syrian, actually a, a segment of the, the former Greek empire. And he, 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 he was a descendant of one of the four generals that divided up Anti uh, Alexander the Great's empire after his death. And uh, in 167, he plundered Jerusalem and profaned the temple. And, and that event is very pivotal um, so you describe in Daniel 8 and 9 and elsewhere, but also Jesus himself makes reference to it as going to happen again at the end time. That's why we study it so carefully to understand it, because Jesus makes reference to it as a, a, uh, an event that's also going to repeat itself here in the future, in effect. But he also talks, it also seems to fit the, uh, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, when Titus, the Roman general, leveled the temple to the ground not leaving one stone upon another. And some people also feel it's also prophetic, the psalm is also prophetic, of these events that will repeat themselves, in a sense, in the great tribulation, at the end of the great, during the great tribulation, in this in so-called 70th week of Daniel. See, so the more you know about history, and the more, no, the more you know about your Bible, the more meaning these psalms will have for you. Some of these psalms may not be that uh, gripping to many of us, and part of that may be because uh, we don't know our Bible that well. They don't fit in with that clearly. Or part of it may be that uh, uh, we uh, 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 just don't know the history. But also, uh, another reason the psalm, some of them may not be that important is because we haven't experienced some of the things that the psalm is dealing with. And, uh, but moving on, uh, Psalm 74, verse 6. But now they break down the carved work thereof at once with axes and hammers. They have cast fire into thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. This describes, this is very descriptive of the temple being burned down as it was in 70 AD. But wait a minute, this was written three, four, five hundred years earlier before that happened. Interesting. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet, neither is there... Among us, any that knoweth how long, O oh God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? Pluck it out of thy bosom. Do you hear the plea? If you hear the anguish, 
of Asaph's psalm, the diaspora lasted 1,900 years as they plead. How long? How long shall the enemy blaspheme thy name? Not us, thy name. Forever. And indeed, the enemy has done that. For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by the strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of the Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Verse 12 is the turning point for the psalm. Here's where Asaph's starting to lift his look up again to God. And uh, we're breaking uh, whales and stuff here. I won't get into all that here. Thou didst cleave the fountain and the flood. Thou driest up mighty rivers. The day is thine, the night is also thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. Remember this, that the enemy hath reproached the Lord, and that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. O deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove unto the multitude of the wicked. Forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. Have respect unto the covenant. For the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. O let not the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. You know, the Lord has delivered people in far worse shape than we're in, in effect. And and he's going to do even greater things in the future. And that's going to all emerge here. Arise, O God, plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproacheth thee daily. Forget not the voice of thine enemies. The tumult of those that rise up against thee increases continually. You know, it's interesting how often Moses, in praying to God, would call God's reputation into question. If you don't help us, the, 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 those people are going to say you, you, you're not powerful enough to do that. I mean, you can see Moses even arguing along the same, the same flavor here. Okay, let's go to Psalm 75. Now, that was a plea for help. These are a series. You know, it, it, one thing, it, it, I wouldn't make the case for all the Psalms, but we do sense that there are clusters of them that have a sequential relationship. And now we're going to go from that prayer, if you will, to a thanksgiving for being delivered. Interesting enough. And uh, so 74 was a prayer, and this one is a song of deliverance. And uh, it's, so it's, a, in effect, a psalm of faith. And Psalm 75, 76, 77, and 78, that group, uh, are some, some associated with the, uh, seems to be descriptive of Hezekiah and his dilemma with the Assyrians and how God miraculously delivered them from the Assyrians, which is described in Isaiah 36 and 37. To the chief musician, Altashith, a psalm or song of Asaph, and I won't try to unravel the, the Altashith really just means destroy not. And, com- and uh, experts are not sure what that meant. Was it, a com- it may have been the name of a common melody that they used. That's one speculation. Uh, who knows? It's a, it, it apparently had mu- it, musical meaning at the time. We don't, it's been lost in the meantime. Anyway, unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks, for that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. When I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it. And then we have this interesting little pause, Selah. Some people regard it as a musical term. Others argue that it's actually a thought linker to pause and connect what's been said. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly, and to the wicked I lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck, for promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. What's left? Strange thing, this strange thing uh, of the north. It speaks of uh, Zion in some psalms. It speaks of God's throne and others. That's where Satan aspired in Isaiah 14 to be up in the sides of the north. It also, the north also is the path through which Jerusalem was always conquered. That's why the Tonia Fortress is built on the north side. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth out the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them, and I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob." All the horns of the wicked also I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. Now, horn is a classic idiom for strength or authority. Obviously, the power of an animal was determined by 
the use of its horn, but that became an idiom of, of, of strength or authority or wicked. Okay. Some of these are very short, so let's relax. There's a sequence. Psalm 74 was a cry for help. Arise, O God. 75 was a song of thanks for God's deliverance out of the clutches of some northern power, and it could fit any of a number of situations. Some people recall the Assyrians coming down against Hezekiah. There's much to say about that in uh, Scripture. But uh, the north was always the avenue of exposure to Jerusalem. But the now... Uh, so they couldn't get help out of the east or the west. Or the, so the north was the trouble. Come, Russia will come from the north in Ezekiel 38. And many people see that starting to take shape in front of us here. So we'll watch and see. So the next psalm shows the Lord Jesus reigning in his kingdom as king and priest, the true Melchizedek. See the pattern here. I think that's kind of interesting. So uh, it may have an eschatological overtone. It may not. I'll leave that up to you. Again, to the chief musician on Neganoth, which is a stringed instrument, a psalm or song of Asaph. In Judah is God known, his name is great in Israel. And uh, in Salem, which is the earlier ancient name for Jerusalem, um, Judah is God known, his name is great in Israel. That can be seen several. Israel can be seen as the broader term. It can also be seen as the northern kingdom versus the southern kingdom, depending... Uh, that all comes later, of course. In Salem, also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. And uh, this has overtones of the divided kingdom because the northern kingdom called itself is the house of Israel. But you remember the woman at the well with Jesus. You know, where where do we where do we should we worship? And Jesus ultimately gets to the point that it's of the Jews in Zion. There break he the arrows of the bow. The shield, the sword, and the battle. Selah. You know, we keep hearing Isaiah 2 4 is quoted so often in the news and so forth. They shall beat their shares into plowshares and her spears into pruning hooks, and nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn any more war anymore, right? Uh, we better not apply that um, to the UN because it doesn't fit, okay? And uh, so. No, they break, he, it isn't going to, not until the Prince of Peace comes. And um, this, the issue of a bow is going to come up again. There is a term I was fascinated to discover in the Psalms called the deceitful bow. That term also occurs in Hosea. And uh, it intrigues me because in Revelation 6 verse 2, the white horseman carries a bow. And if you, if you uh, apply the principle of what they call expositional constancy, um, that bow is deceitful. Interesting. Our leader carries a sword, not a bow. Big difference. Thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted are spoiled. They have slept their sleep, and none of the men of might have found their hands. At thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse are cast into dead sleep. And uh, the mountains of prey, that refers, of course, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is uh, probably been the most preyed upon city of ancient times. It has been preyed upon 27 times has Jerusalem been invaded or taken over or whatever. And, of course, uh, verse f uh, 5 here, speaking of men of, uh, you know, uh, being slept and so forth, the whole world lies asleep in whose arms? The wicked one. 1 John 5, 19, for those of you who want a reference on that. And uh, thou, even thou art to be feared, and who may stand in thy sight when, when once thou art angry? <laughs> That's a good question. When God gets angry, watch out, huh? Thou didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. The God rose to judgment and to save all the meek of the earth. Selah. There's that pause again. And uh, I'm reminded by this with, of Revelation 6.17, where John says, For the great day of his wrath, the wrath of the Lamb, has come. And who shall be able to stand? It's the same thought here. A.W. Tozer made a great remark in this flavor. He said, No one can know the true grace of God who hasn't first known the fear of God. I want to think about that. 
You know, we tend to be so comfortable in the grace of God and his mercy and the benefits he showers upon us. We do need to understand and apprehend the fear of God. That really comes first. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of the wrath shalt thou restrain. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. You know, today... Man is being restrained. Doesn't seem like it at times, does it? But we know the restrainer is still operative. The restrainer, the Holy Spirit. Nothing else can restrain the world today. But the day will come when he's going to be removed. During the Great Tribulation, the restrainer is removed. And boy, then man will go to the limit. Man will go to the limit. God is going to end up making the wrath of man praise him. Before it's all over. Wow well, is right. That says it all. You betcha. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is terrible. Or awesome might be a better term. To the kings of the earth. And that's that one. Let's go to Psalm 77. To the chief musician. To Dedithan, Who also is known as Ethan earlier, by the way. There's three key guys. But you saw, often see four names. Ethan and Jedithan are the same guy, two guys. Anyway. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. That's probably him finding a way to say that God is real and he's listening. We need to understand that. Simple idea. God is real and he is listening. And you need to prove it to yourself by trying that. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Absorb that. Thou should holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart. And my spirit made diligent search. My spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. He, Asaph's asking some questions here. My wife wrote a book called Faith in the Night Seasons. It deals with that time in your Christian experience where it seems that God has turned his receiver off. He ain't hearing you. You feel isolated. Very dark time. And yet that's God's way of bringing you into real intimacy, interestingly enough. Now Asaph here has actually asked six questions. Has he rejected us? What's the answer? Of course not. He's faithful to his word. Lamentations 3 by Jeremiah hammers that home. Will he ever again show favor to Israel? That's the plea of the apparently abandoned. Of course, the answer is yes, he will show favor to Israel. Psalm 30 dealt with that. Isaiah 60 deals with that. There's other passages. Has his unfailing love vanished forever? It seems that way sometimes. But no. Jeremiah, is, many verses you can assemble to answer each one of these. I threw a few out there. Jeremiah 31, 3. Have his promises failed? Never. Not at all. First Kings 8, 56 and others are rebuttals to that. Has he forgotten to be gracious? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Of course not. Isaiah 49, God answers that. And is he so angry that he has shut up his compassions? Not at all. It may seem that way at times and Asaph is being candid. We applaud his candor. At the same time, there's some myopia involved here. And of course, he's, he hasn't shut up his compassion. That's what Lamentations hammers. It, it's if considers, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I'll remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember his, the, his, thy wonders of old. I'll meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? 
So Asaph's reminding himself of the incredible history that he is, his heritage has brought him to. That God has had his hand on the nation all along. And Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews mentions this too. We need to do the same thing. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more though, as we see the day approaching. One of the things we need to do as we get into some of these dark, reproachful times is to uh, assemble. That's where, that's where you get the, that's the strength of the fellowship. Psalmist continues, Thou art God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. See again, the strength in the fellowship. We can look around this fellowship and see people that have been the beneficiary of miracles. We know God is active. That's, that's incredible encouragement. Incredible encouragement. Psalmist continues, the waters saw thee, O God, the waters saw thee, they were afraid, the depths also were troubled, the clouds poured out water, the skies sent out a sound, thine arrows also went abroad, the voice of thy thunder was in the heaven, the lightnings lightened the world, the earth trembled and shook. Thy way is in the sea, and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Thou lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So it's talking here, apparently making allusion to the crossing of the Red Sea. That would be one, one view of what's, what's in view here. There's some other conjectures. I'll, I'll, we'll just keep moving. Now let's get to Psalm 78. This is a little different kind of a psalm. This is what's called a history psalm. Psalm 78 is this way. Also Psalm 105, 106. 114, 135, 136 are history psalms. And um, this one is the history of Israel from Moses to David. And it's going to focus on the failure of the people, but the faithfulness of God. The failure of the people, the faithfulness of God. You know, Hegel is famous for his remark. He says, history teaches us that man learns nothing from history. <laughs> That's the way he expressed it. George Santayana said the same thing in another way. He says, those that cannot remember history are condemned to repeat it. <laughs> Let's take a look at the history of Psalm. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Concline thine ears to the words of my mouth. The word law, by the way, is Torah. The word Torah means law. It also means instruction. You see, some people say, well, you should keep the Torah. No, the word Torah it means instruction. So... It's not that simple. But anyway, to incline your ears to the words of my mouth, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Dark sayings, what we would call a riddle or an enigma. Solomon collected them. We talked about that when we went through Proverbs. Which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from, our ch from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. You know, one of the great, great tragedies in our country is that we can't give our kids any instruction about our heritage because we didn't get any. Teachers can't teach in school because they don't know it. And it's amazing how we've lost over several generations now any grasp, except in military families perhaps, of the incredible heritage of this country. It's evaporating. But what God is intended is for fathers, to you know, fathers and sons, you know, children to be taught by their parents all the way through. The wonderful works that God has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob. He appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that, he sh that they should make, known to their, make them known to their children. That's the pattern. Interesting, the only, form of bi only biblical form of schooling is homeschooling. I just thought I'd throw that out for you to think about that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with thy God. So we're, talk, we're going to talk about apostates all through here. The first group, the first verses 9 through 11, will deal with the northern kingdom that was established in rebellion. In, uh, to, uh, when uh, Rehoboam took over and raised the taxes, Jeroboam took the northern off, they rebelled, and they set up not only a separate entity, but a separate religion. 
Ephraim was the dominant area, and that, that tribe becomes idiomatic for the whole group. Ephraim was adopted and elevated to firstborn, you remember, by Jacob, when Joseph brought his two kids from Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim, but, but Jacob, by the Holy Spirit, uh, elevated Ephraim to the, the role of the firstborn. Joshua, Moses' successor, came from that tribe. Jeroboam, the founder of this northern kingdom, was, of course, from Ephraim. Even the tabernacle, for a while, stood at Shiloh, which is Ephraim. And it later will go to Nob, which is technically in Benjamin, and later to Gibeon before finally going to Jerusalem. But for a while there, Ephraim was the, the, a major center, if you will. So it talks about this here for a few verses. The children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. And uh, they kept not the covenant of God and they refused to walk in his law. They forgot his works and his wonders that he showed them. So then we get to the next. We're now going to talk. He's gonna, the uh, psalm is going to shift. Uh, he's going actually backwards in time. He's going to talk about the Exodus generation. That's the generation that died in the wilderness, several million people. That those that were 20 and younger survived, but the rest passed off because they, they blew it. The lessons in the wilderness. Remember, they, they obviously had they'd forgotten the futility of the Egyptian gods that were demonstrated by the plagues in Egypt that got them out of Egypt. They forgot about all of that. Remember the water miracles? Striking the rock when they needed water twice. Exodus 17 and then Numbers 20. And uh, the giving of manna. All these things were going on during 38 years of wandering. Supernatural food being provided. They were not happy with that. They wanted fowl, right? And so God gave them quail. You know, one of God's greatest judgments is to give us what we want. That happens, happened with them with quail. It often happens when there's an affair outside of marriage. They get judged by getting what they think they want and discovering... So that's a judgment. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zom. He divided the sea, caused them to pass through, he made the waters to stand as a heap. They of just reminding them of these miracles that they all forget. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud on all the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness, in fact twice, and gave them to drink as out of the great depths. And you know, at Jabal Allah, they found the rock that's been split and the incredible erosion that seems to have occurred there. Absolutely fascinating to get into that. He brought streams out of the rock and caused the waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God by their heart, asking, them, asking meat for their lust. Manna wasn't enough, they wanted meat. Yea, they spake against God, they said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Well, he did, all right. <laughs> well, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out, the streams overflowed. Can he give us bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger came up against Israel, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. You remember that. It was one failure after another, then judgment, and so on. All the way through the book of Numbers, of course, is the profile of that. Though he had commanded the clouds from above, he opened the doors of heaven and it rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens and by his power he brought in the south wind. And he rained flesh upon them as dust and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. And he let it fall in the midst of their camp, round about their habitations, so they did eat and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. And they were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. Strange times. Strange times. For all this they sinned still, believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity, and their years in trouble. When he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. 
The word earnestly might be a better translation for, for early. They remember that God was the rock, the high God, the redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth and they lied unto him with their tongues for their heart was not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity, destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath, for he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes away and cometh not again. So then he slips from after verse 39. He's going to go now talking about the, repeating the lessons of Egypt itself. How oft they provoke him in the wilderness and they grew him in the desert. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day that he delivered them from the enemy. How he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan. And had turned their rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. He sent divers sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs, which destroyed them. He gave them also increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locusts. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave up their cattle also to the hail and the flocks to hot thunderbolts. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death but gave their life over to the pestilence. Those nine plagues... Ten, if you count the death of the firstborn, but those plagues, incredible reading, Exodus 12 and following. And smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength in the tabernacles of Ham, but made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock, and he led them on safely, so that they feared not, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. <laughs> I always think, I'm always amused by, they always have these people say, well, there was a wind and the, 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 the river was only three foot deep. That's how they got across. That sets the stage for even a bigger miracle to have the whole Egyptian army drown in three feet of water. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> then the psalmist turns to the time of the judges, the third generation in Canaan that turned to idols. After Joshua, they did a pretty good job, they, but it was the generation after that. So the second generation didn't do bad. Third generation, book of Judges, Blew it. He brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, which is his right hand had purchased. He cast out the heathen also before them and divided them in inheritance by line and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and provoked the most high God and kept not his testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. There's that interesting expression. Deceitful bow. It occurs in Hosea 7 verse 16. And Revelation 6, verse 2, that might give us some clues as to why it is the white horseman in Revelation 6 being carrying a bow. Anyway, for they provoked him to anger with their high places, moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel. So that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which had been placed among men, he delivered his strength unto captivity and his glory to the enemy's hand. The book of Judges records seven different nations that invaded Israel and God raises up judges and they, when they repent and then the, and when people will, will, will turn to him, there was just a continual sequence of failures. He gave his people over also into the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given to marriage. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awaked as one out of a sleep and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. He's using that metaphorically as if he woke up and you know, got at it. He smote his enemies in the hinder parts. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> we have a different way of saying it today, but I won't go there and put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim. See, that's a rejection of the northern kingdom. But chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built a sanctuary like high palaces, like the earth which he hath established forever. He chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. And following the ewes, great with the young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. And that's it. That's that psalm. Psalm 79. 
And this may, may speak of Israel. This is a prayer for God's people, of course, the nation of Israel. But it may apply most poignantly in the period yet to come. This terrible time of trouble that's yet to emerge. And uh, so, again, it's a psalm of Asaph. Now, this can be, uh, include allusions to the siege of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century B.C., very possibly. It also can, be, uh, can include allusions to the Maccabean period, which occurred after the desecration by Antiochus Epiphanes. But the ultimate prophecy application here would be, uh, the ultimate fulfillment would be in the Great Tribulation. Okay. Now you need to understand how Jerusalem stood in those early days. The false prophets were saying that God would never allow destruction and captivity. And two guys, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, said the contrary. He said, you're hearing, listening to the false prophets, God is going to judge. And uh, so, obviously the prophecy that the city would never be taken uh, was false, and the inhabitants were carried away to captivity, just as Ezekiel and Jeremiah had predicted. Jeremiah was thrown in a dungeon as a traitor because of his predictions. They said the temple would never be destroyed. It was destroyed, just as they destroyed it. And uh, the temple, the, the, their sanctuary was the center of all things for them. So let's jump in. Uh, Psalm of Asaph, Psalm 79. O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance, the holy temple, and uh, have they defiled? They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to meat unto the fowls of the heaven, and the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. See, this is their painful dilemma. Understand how they must have felt. This horrible carnage that, that uh, they thought they were immune to. Why was God permitting this to happen to them? See, the false prophets have been constantly telling them that this could not happen to God's people. Wrong. The prophet of Jeremiah had been faithfully giving God's warning, so much so that he was, as I say, uh, being put into a dungeon. He was discredited and labeled as a traitor. You know, we got to be careful. Uh, we might have the same false confidence about ourselves with America. That God's judgment may be overdue on ourselves for a different but parallel set of reasons. The Israelites could not understand why God had not protected them. And this is still a question today in Israel. A great many Jews have become atheists because of the terrible persecution and suffering of their people in Germany during Hitler's dictatorship. Just that alone. And we should understand, it is understandable why they feel that way. We never go to visit Israel without spending some hours in Yad Vashem. And the Yad Vashem Memorial has been incredibly um, improved. It's a moving experience to really understand all that. See, Israel today justifiably would have the same question the psalmist has. But have they been faithful to God? Are they back in a proper relationship with Him? Have they accepted His Messiah? Of course not. Are they turning to him? Some are. That's a very interesting uh, thing that's happening. But in general, of course, the answer is no. Judgment has come upon the nations of the world, nations just like us. We need to understand that. As we see ourselves slide further and further into paganism and the rebellion against the God of the Bible, we should understand what the Results of that is de destined to be. Let's go on to Psalm, uh, Psalm 79, verse 3. Their blood have they shed like waters round about Jerusalem. There was none to bury them. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. How long, O Lord? Wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. Oh, remember not against us former iniquities. 
Let thy tender mercy speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. And uh, see, wherever the Christ is rejected, there's judgment. You either meet him in judgment or redemption. There are only two ways. Now let's listen to the cry here. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of thy name, and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is their God? Let him be known among the heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of thy servants which is shed. And uh, to, uh, Israel had been making the boast that God would, uh, uh, you know, was going to deliver them. And he had not delivered them. And so the heathen obviously were making fun of them. That's causing the enemies of God to blaspheme. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those who, that are appointed to die. Render unto our neighbors sevenfold unto their bosom the reproach wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. So we, thy people and sheep of thy pasture, will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. And uh, so, praise from generation to generation. That's what it really said. And uh, so, heavy stuff. Heavy stuff has happened. Heavy stuff is still coming. Well, now we've got a prayer, the last one of this series uh, for tonight, prayer to the shepherd of Israel, to the chief musician of the Shoshana Nemeth, which I, something has something to do with lilies. No one's quite sure what it has to do with lilies. Was it a theme or just a... Anyway, there's all speculations, but we're not sure what that really means, okay? And uh, beautiful lilies has occurred several times in these psalms. And that would indefinitely, uh, it, it, it ultimately, uh, you should say, uh, re, uh, refer to Jesus Christ, the lily of the valleys. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims. Who would that be? Huh? God himself, right. Dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. Why does he mention those three? That's interesting. Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh. Stir up thy strength and come and save us. What makes them distinctive? Why these three tribes? Why would Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, Manasseh be mentioned? Now, if you remember our study in Numbers, you know that those three tribes followed the Ark of the Covenant. They're immediately behind the Ark in the, in the order of March, in Numbers 2, 17 through 24. It was the Ark that led the children of Israel through the wilderness, as God led them once before, their cry is for, them, for him to lead them again. That's really what's embodied in that idiom, idiomatic usage there. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and givest them tears to drink in great measure. Boy. Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Turn us again, O God. This is going to occur three times in this psalm. And uh, this is a sad part of the psalm. It's going to shift here in a minute. Thou feedest them with bread of tears. Boy. The psalmist feels that God is angry because he doesn't seem to answer the prayer of his people. Thou makes a strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Let's talk a little bit about their history. Luke 19. The Lord's riding a donkey up over the hill of Mount of Olives. And as he comes up over the hill, it says he beheld the city. And what did he do when he saw the city? He wept over it. Why? He said, if thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they're hidden from thine eyes. He pronounces judicial judgment on the nation at that point. Not forever. Paul tells us how long. In Romans 11, 25. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. And 38 years later, after he said that, that's exactly what happened. Over a million, some say a million and a half, men, women, and children were slaughtered in those nine months by the siege of Titus that brought down the big milestone in Jewish history called the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Why was Jerusalem destroyed? Lots of different, let's see what Jesus said. Why did this all happen? 
Thou shalt lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. He held them accountable to know what Gabriel had told Daniel some five centuries earlier. This was the very day that was appointed, and the very day that they rejected him. That's what's going on. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. That's Luke 19. A few days later that same week, he says to the women, Jesus turning to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. That's what's coming. And he's not talking about Nazi Germany. He's talking about Jerusalem and it's yet to come. The first holocaust took one Jew and three on the planet Earth. According to Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9, the next one will take two out of three. That's coming. You can see it starting. Psalm says, turn us, turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparest the room before it. Thou didst, and, and it's caused it to take deep root and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it. The boughs thereof were like goodly cedars. Up front, of course, is the, it's almost like the Old Testament benediction in number six. The use of a vine is used all through the scriptures. The classical one is uh, Isaiah 5, first seven verses. Um, it's used, again, all through uh, allusions of the vine. But uh, number one. A repeated pattern. God brings the nation of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. He cast the heathen nations out of the land of Palestine, planted Israel, his vine. There, Israel built a temple in which to worship God. They were told that the temple would be destroyed and they would be put out of the land. Why? Why would God undo what he did? For the same reason, he put the heathen out of the land. They turned their backs upon God. And as I read this sort of thing, and I try to study this thing, I get nervous because I see America doing the same thing. We were not founded that way. With all our imperfections, you look at the leadership of this country that founded this country, it's astonishing to see, see the quality of their writing and their focus. All of them. And now it's being stripped out of our culture major political parties working hard to erase and revise our heritage. And, the, and uh, I think it's going to come at a very high price. She sent out her boughs unto the sea and her branches into the river. Why hast thou broken down her hedges so that all which pass by do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. See, for years, God planted his vine, put a hedge about the land. That's described in Isaiah 5 and other, other places. They lived in the land for 600 years. God did not permit any of the great nations of that day to destroy them, though they tried. God wouldn't let it. Egypt came against Israel, had some victories, but did not destroy them. The same is true of Syria and the Hittite nation. But the day came when God removed the hedge and let the enemies of Israel come in. Why did he do that? Because they rejected their shepherd. The painful truth, we don't like to press it, but it's reality. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. The vineyard which thy right hand hath planted and the branch which thou hast made strong for thyself, it is burned with fire, it is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. Let thy hand be upon the man of who? Thy right hand. Ooh, that's an interesting phrase. Upon the son of man whom thou made strong for thyself. Oh, there's a messianic reference if I ever saw one. Who is at God's right hand? Israel's Messiah. David wrote in Psalm 110, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That's Old Testament text. Jesus quotes it to the Pharisees and sends them into confusion in Matthew 22. He applied this to himself before the lawyers there when they challenged his messianic claim. In Genesis chapter 35, 
we have a son born. Rachel gave birth to her second son along the roadside that leads to, to Bethlehem. You can still see her, the, 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 the grave there. Benjamin was the baby, but she didn't call him that. She called him Benoni. Son of my suffering was her title. But Jacob looked upon him and said, no, we won't call him Benoni. We'll call him Benjamin because he's the son of my right hand. He's both. He's the son of my suffering. He's the suffering servant, as per the cross, etc. But he's also exalted and glorified as the son of God's right hand. So Benjamin is got a, that's a real heritage there. He's a picture or a type, as we would call it, of our Lord Jesus, who came to the earth first as a son of suffering, but today he's at God's right hand. Straightforward enough, right? Again, Psalm 110, sit thou my right hand until I make thine enemies for Psalm 110, verse 1, one of the most quoted Psalms in the New Testament. And he's going to return from that position to the earth. Right now he's on his father's throne. He's going to be on his own. Hosea 5.15. I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. In their affliction they will seek me earnestly. Psalmist continues, So we will not go back from thee. Quicken us that we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O God of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. That's the third time we have this restorative benediction. Okay, that's our first pass through this here. And we're going to take the, that's half of book three. In the next session, I want you to, for it, I want you to meditate on the remainder of book three. Psalms 81 to 89. And uh, that's nine of them, but many of them are quite short. And I encourage you to embrace that, and we will have dealt with the entire book three for the next time.